Welcome. In this presentation, I'm going to go over study designs. Hopefully, this will help you as you prepare your study design assignments. And I'm going to start with a study design that most of you will not have selected for your assignment, but you should be aware of it exists and why it's used. So the first type of study design is an ecological study. So what is that? That's also referred to as a correlational study. So that's where, imagine you have a large graphic comparing disease rates like, for example, breast cancer in populations with uh, population level or per capita consumption of a specific dietary factor or some other exposure. So that would be where you don't necessarily have individual level information at all. You might have information on the mean breast cancer rate in various countries and the mean per capita intakes of various countries. And without any individual level information, you might look to see whether the countries with the highest um, per capita intake of dietary fat also have the highest rates of breast cancer. And this is a first level type of study that's often done uh, with little resources, little information, and it can help in exploring or identifying possible realms or avenues for research. The main strength of an ecological study is that it's relatively inexpensive. In the field of nutrition, there are additional strengths, and I'm using nutrition as an example because it's a field that I know well. Uh, when we take, at the group level, a mean intake of the group, that information is more stable as an estimate than the intake of individuals where one day of diet is not a good reflection of that person's usual intake. So if you have group level information in nutrition data, the mean intake is a pretty good estimate of what the intake will be for that group the next day and the day after. In other words, the variation of one individual to the next is canceled out by taking an estimate of the whole group, looking at it from the mean. Another advantage is that average diet is more stable over time than the diet of individuals. So if you take the mean intake of the group and at the group level, that's probably going to be the same as if you had taken it last week or two, two weeks ago or even sometimes a year ago if you haven't had a lot of change in the environment and the nutritional environment over time. Additionally, disease rates from a large population are relatively stable. So the information that you're getting at the group level is probably a good reflection for that group in addition to the fact that it's relatively inexpensive. However, there are a number of limitations. So in ecological study, there's a reason why it's not the final analysis. Usually it's the beginning point. And that is uh, because if you're looking at the population level, you might actually find that the people who have that disease are not the people who ate that high fat diet. So by relying on information that's at the population rather than the individual level, you actually might get it wrong. And that ultimately is what we call the ecological fallacy. So the data might not exist at the group level, so that's another reason why an ecological study might be limited. So for the research question you're interested in, it's very likely that the data doesn't exist for that because only certain types of information are aggregated and published at the group level, country level, community level, etc. Another thing is, is that the results cannot be independently re reproduced because it's just based on the data that happened to be reported. So usually you're using convenience data and not expressly collecting information at the group level. Usually if you do intentionally collect information at the group level, then you can also identify which individuals have that exposure and which individuals have that outcome. But the results, when they're wrong, it has to do with that ecological fallacy, which is the idea that the group level information is aggregating information. So you don't actually know whether, even if there is a high correlation between countries with a high fat intake and a high breast cancer intake, whether those individuals who consumed the high fat are also the ones who had the greater risk of breast cancer. It might simply be that both measures are related to economic advancement or dietary changes that are happening in the population and the relationship between 
that particular exposure and that particular disease that you see at correlation level is not actually true at the individual level. So that's the ecological fallacy that you always have to think about. And as you're reading information, if you're looking at aggregated data um, of an ecological study, be aware that that's an issue. What is a case control study? So this is something that is confusing for many students. So I'm going to go delve into this in depth. A case control study is where you start with the individuals who have the disease and you look to compare them to a group of people who don't have the disease to see if that particular exposure that you're looking for is different in the cases and the controls. Diseased cases are identified first, and then they're compared to the non-disease control population in relation to the exposure. And this association is assessed using an odds ratio. So that's an estimate of the concept of risk where you're looking at whether the diseased population, the diseased cases, are more likely to have been exposed. So you're looking backwards in time, looking at past exposure. So the odds ratio is an estimate of risk related to the exposure. So remember when we went through the comparison between odds ratios and risk ratios, when we do a case control study, we're getting an odds ratio and we're saying, are the cases more likely to have been exposed? And then we're trying to use that information to understand their ultimate risk. So think back to Jon Snow, the cholera epidemic. How many people, cases with cholera, had one water source as compared to the other? And are, was their exposure to the different water sources different than the control group or the people who did not have cholera? And that's what Jon Snow was getting at when he came up with this measure of the odds ratio. And ultimately, mathematically, you know from our previous discussions that the odds ratios can be linked to a risk ratio uh, mathematically and conceptually so that even though you're actually assessing the concept of exposed versus unexposed and people who already have the disease, ultimately what you're finding out is are the people with that exposure then more likely to get the disease. So I know that's a leap of logic. So you're assessing the diseased and not diseased, seeing whether they're more likely to have the exposure. And through a series of assumptions, that can be an estimate of whether that exposure contributes to risk because it's related to how the odds ratio or how well the odds ratio assesses the concept of risk ratio. What are the strengths of a case control study? Well, first of all, it is much less time consuming. So especially if you're taking a snapshot in time, you're starting with cases, you're looking at controls, uh, like in the Jon Snow example, people with cholera, people who didn't have cholera, what, kind, what are the water sources that they had? It's very cost efficient in that moment, and it's particularly efficient for a rare disease. So if you're looking at something like cholera, and you're starting with the cases and you're comparing them to the controls, you're not having to wait until a set of people with that water source get the cholera. You're already finding out who had the cholera and who didn't and comparing their water sources. This is an efficient method, particularly with a prevalent exposure. Think of a water source. Everybody in London had some source of water. So you could easily compare those with and without cholera to their different types of water sources. Now, it might be that you're looking at something where the disease is rare and the exposure is also rare, and that becomes more complicated with the case control study design, and that requires a very large sample size. Another thing with a case control study, because it's an observational study, you're not changing anything, you're not giving any exposure, you're not doing any interventions, you can explore associations related to increased risk without introducing any ethical concerns. So obviously you find the cases, you find the controls. The cases, they're diseased, they will have to be treated for that disease, but you're looking back in time for their previous exposure, so treating their disease should not change any relationships.
Okay, so I've already mentioned one of the major limitations of a case control study, and that's right at the top of the slide, and that is that if an exposure is rare, it requires a very large study population. So just to give you an example so you can imagine it, imagine that your exposure you're looking for is whether cases consumed a particular brand of bottled water. That's going to be a rare exposure, and if you're disease outcome is also rare, then you would not really be able to do this analysis unless you had a very large study population in order to capture that rare exposure. Another thing is recall bias. So imagine you're doing a case control study and you're looking for that particular brand of water to see if that's related to being a case or a control. Uh, if you have a case control study design, it might be that the cases are more aware of what they're consuming, both in terms of food and in terms of water, and they might be more likely to even remember things like a brand than a control population would be. When it comes to things like dietary assessment in particular, there is a greater chance of error in a case control study design because if you're asking people about their diet, whether that was their diet from two weeks ago, their diet from today, or even their diet from 10 years ago, cases are going to be different from controls even if they're not different in their diet because they'll remember different. We, and that is related to the recall bias concept, um, but it's particularly strong when you're asking people to remember back. Uh, but even if it's not about asking people to remember back, they might have changed their diet in relation to having been diagnosed. So if they have a cancer diagnosis, it's not in addition to the fact that they might remember differently, maybe even better than the controls, they might have changed their diet so that their current dietary assessment, if you're asking them what they ate today, would not be a reflection of their usual intake in the same way that the control group might do. The next type of study design is a longitudinal cohort study. Now it's possible to have a longitudinal cohort study that is then used for a case control study design. So that's where longitudinal cohort data is taken and the cases are taken at the end of that study and they're compared to controls in relation to exposures that were already collected. Now that's considered to be a nested case control study. So that is a different type of study design than what I'm gonna talk about here. So just remember you can take that longitudinal type of data and do a nested case control study, or you can have it be a proper observational longitudinal cohort study. And that would mean that you're looking at the exposure at the beginning and you're comparing those who have that exposure to those who don't have that exposure and you're waiting, you're following them over time to identify who becomes new cases of the disease and who does not. So you're looking at the exposed do, are they more likely to develop the disease compared to the unexposed? There are a number of strengths of a longitudinal cohort study, and the first one relates back to the causal criteria. Remember that concept of temporality, and that's the idea that the exposure is assessed before the outcome. So the exposure is assessed prospectively eliminating recall bias. You know that the person was exposed or unexposed before they knew that they had the disease. Now this is also a strength, not just of the longitudinal observational cohort study, it's also a strength of the nested case control study that uses a longitudinal cohort in its study selection. So you can get, if you have specifically a nested case control study, you get this advantage there as well. If all study subjects are tested for the disease in a longitudinal cohort design, it eliminates bias related to diagnosis. And that's really particularly important for a longitudinal observational cohort. So if you have a group who are exposed and unexposed and you're looking to see if they're different in terms of whether or not they get the disease, if everybody is being tested for that disease, there's no bias related to access to healthcare. Everybody has the same chance of being diagnosed. A longitudinal study design also has an advantage 
for analysis with repeated assessments or repeated measurements of the exposure. Now that's something that you probably won't be integrating into your study designs. I don't recommend it at this level, but it's just something to be aware of that sometimes you have study uh, exposures that will vary over time, like different types of levels of fat intake or changing uh, levels of exposure and that you want to capture all of those changing uh, exposure levels in a longitudinal way. That is something that you can only do with a longitudinal cohort study. Another thing that is an advantage of all observational studies is that in an observational study you're not actually making a change, so you're not giving an intervention. So you can explore associations that relate to increased risks. You can't do that when you're doing an experimental design where you're giving an intervention. A limitation of a longitudinal cohort study, major limitation has to do with a rare disease. So remember, rare disease, it's usually better to do a case control study design because then you can focus on the people who get the disease, compare them to a set of controls. You have the numbers that you need of cases uh, for your analysis. In a cohort study, it would take a large sample size and particularly if it occurs over a long period of time, that becomes very costly. In addition, in a cohort study, you're asking for people at two different moments. So by definition, there will be a higher subject burden in a longitudinal cohort study than in a, any kind of cross-sectional type of study design. In addition, you have a high loss to follow-up. So the, especially for a longer term study, you're going to have even more follow-up. But in any case, you have your final point of measurement, whether or not they get the disease or not, uh, there will be people who aren't there and who don't want to continue participating in the study, who leave the area, who fall out of contact, and you can't reach them. And finally, there is a possibility that if you're not diagnosing or testing everybody in the study, that there could be diagnosis bias in the exposed. So if you set up a study where you're comparing people who are exposed and unexposed, they, they may be more likely to be diagnosed if they have that exposure, if, for example, their doctors are aware that that exposure might be related to that outcome. So there is a potential in this type of study design for diagnosis bias unless you integrate into your study design uh, an assurance that everybody will be tested. The final study design I'm going to talk about is the randomized controlled trial. This is an intervention type of study design or an experimental study design. And I'll start with an example uh, to explain the concept of a double-blinded process, but we'll also talk about examples that cannot be double-blind, especially if you talk about interventions that people will necessarily be aware of as the intervention. So if it's a food-based intervention, they know they're getting the intervention, you know they're getting the intervention, that's not double-blind. Or if it's a community-level intervention, again, it's impossible to be blinded to an intervention that is at a community level that everybody sees what is being done. In a clinical trial, so the experimental type of design that is a randomized clinical trial, Typically, you would have study subjects that are randomly allocated the intervention of the control. That allocation would be identified and kept separately so that the study subjects would not know whether the pills they're getting are the new intervention or the supplement or whether they're getting the control or the placebo. The intervention and control group allocation would also not be known to the researchers who are actually interacting with the study subject. So you only break that process to know who was in the intervention of the control group at the very end when you're doing your analysis. So ideally the study subject and those conducting the study, so the researchers themselves, would be blinded to the assignment while the study is going on. And the only exception would be if you start to see um, negative outcomes or uh, if the people doing the analysis. So usually you collect the data and hand that over to people who are doing the analysis who are then not blinded to whether or not these, these results have gotten the intervention or the control, uh, but they wouldn't have that immediate contact with the study subjects.
Now, what does this mean at the community level? So some of you have considered a community level uh, randomized intervention with a control group. Well, what does that mean? That would mean that you have a large number of communities that are willing to be randomized into an intervention and that are willing to serve at least temporarily as a control. So that would be to say, I expect, here's an intervention, I expect for this amount of time that I would be able to identify whether this intervention is effective. And then at the end of that follow-up time, so you can say maybe it will be a year, maybe it will be six months, at the end of that time period, you could then provide the intervention to all groups so that all communities benefit. What are the strengths of a randomized controlled study? Well, the first thing is that potentially distorting variables are randomly distributed in a large study population. At the individual level, that's really easy to imagine. Imagine you have 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, and you randomly allocate who is going to be in your intervention group, your give the new medicine, give that vitamin supplement, versus the control group, give standard care or give that placebo. And if you have 10,000 people, say you have a total sample of 20,000 people and 10,000 are randomly given one group versus the other, you would expect if that randomization process worked that both groups would have the same proportion of different ages, economic status, etc., because it's randomly allocated. So there should not be any confounding variables if the randomization really worked. The intervention approach allows researchers to assign a greater difference in exposure that might naturally occur. So in an observational study, you would be limited to the types of interventions that people would self-select for. But an intervention would say, we can increase this um, community level change, or we can increase the amounts of fruits and vegetables that people take, or give a higher dose of a supplement than people usually will, will take, um, if we think that there, we have good reason to believe based on the observational studies that there may be benefit to it. So the intervention type of approach allows for more scaling of the differences in the exposure and to identify whether those benefits that have been found in observational studies are actually true when they're given in an experimental type of design. There are also a number of limitations to this approach. Um, that is, you have to think of what can be given in a randomized and controlled approach. So double blinding is only possible for certain types of studies, particularly involving some type of pill. So supplementation trials or a new medicine compared to the existing medicine. You can only explore associations where you really expect benefit. So there should already be a significant amount of research showing that there are benefits to this intervention or there's reason to believe that there will be benefits to this intervention and we need to follow up conclusively that those benefits are really related to that, that exposure, that thing that people are doing and that it's not the type of people who choose that exposure are different and have a different disease profile. The outcome and the diseases measured can only be limited to things that would reasonably chain with it, change within the time frame of the trial. So if you're looking at a six month to a one year time frame, you can only see the benefit or the progress that's realistic for that time frame. So if you're looking for some uh, changes in cancer rates, for example, you would have to make sure that your randomized controlled trial is focused on people who have a risk that could be improved within the time frame that you have to do your study. 